Hello and welcome to Straight Out of Scriptures, where we tell biblical truth and give scriptural perspective about today's issue. Today I have a topic before me that is quite exciting. Um, it's something that has caused a lot of rancor and debate in the Christian faith and the body of Christ even today. I want to look at the pages of scriptures and see from scriptures what exactly is the truth concerning this matter. And the topic is, are all my sins forgiven? Are all my past, present sins, future sins forgiven even in Christ? Uh, right? The issue has not be, always been about us when we give our life to Christ, uh, about our past sins. It has always been what happened to my present and my future sins. That's always been the issue. So today we want to look at exactly what does the scripture says even about this matter. Right? If I give my life to Christ and then afterwards I'm involved in homosexuality, I'm involved in stealing, involved in all of these other vices. Uh, does God account it as sin? I mean, this is what we want to look at today. Uh, and um, if you are looking for answers, then I say welcome to the place of answer. I'm going to share this with clarity. You are going to understand that this thing is not supposed to be debated. It's, it's very clear from scriptures, from pages of scriptures. And I just want you to sit back. If this is your first time on this channel, Please share this link with somebody. If this topic bless you, share it with somebody. And uh, please engage. I want to know what you see, what you feel, what you think about this. And again, be a Berean Christian. Go find out from scriptures again. I'm going to give some Bible references. Uh, please read the scriptures again and let's see what it means. All right. This is straight out of scriptures. Telling biblical truth and giving scriptural perspective. All right. Welcome, let's get into the business of today. I believe we want to talk about what does the Bible say about our present, our past, and our future sins. One of the key things to do is to understand what is sin. Because if I want to understand what the past, the present, and the future of a thing says, then I first of all must know what is the thing. I think the appropriate place to start therefore is to define what sin is. So understand that in Hebrew word, the Hebrew word for sin in scriptures, and the Greek word for sin in scriptures, the Hebrew word is the word kata, which is spelled K-H-A-T-A. -A. And the Greek word is the word amatia, H-A-M-A-R-T-I-A. -A -A. And both of them have the same meaning. It means to miss the mark, to miss the mark. And according to 1 John chapter 3 and then verse 4, John defined sin as lawlessness. Uh, and that word lawlessness that he used in the Greek is the word anomia. And this is exciting. This is interesting. That word anomia actually is the word disobedience. Uh, is the word transgression. All right. So sin is transgressing or disobeying the ways, the wills and the act of God. So if God has made clear his ways, he has made clear his will uh, and, and you go against it, uh, then it's a sin. Sin is deviating from the will of God, whether that by commission or by omission. I believe if we have done that, if we understand that to be what sin is, uh, then we can then go further and say, okay, uh, what does our sin what does he need what our sin need is forgiveness and i believe it's okay to ask that question what happens to my sin my past my present and my future sin and when people ask that question and, and they are saying are all my past my present and my future sins forgiven in christ the question they are actually asking is can a believer commit sin can a born again believer actually commit sin if that born again believer is only seen in Christ Jesus by God, can he commit sin? You're, well, to answer that question, let's look at logic, right? If you are a born again believer and you are saying God forgives your future sin, like some people say, then logically it means therefore that you will sin. Because if you are saying God forgives, my future sin is already forgiven in Christ, then you are saying there is something called a future sin. So that logically explains and answer that question, can a born again believer sin? Because the fact that you are even talking about a future sin is letting me know that you know there is something called sin. So if God forgives your future sin, then obviously you both can and will sin. Now the question is, and it's interesting, it's an interesting question is that can God forgive my 
future sin. And but as all my future sin be forgiven in Christ? I'd like to answer that question by asking and by saying something that, you know, um, I believe the way to look at time is through that philosophical belief of what we call temporal becoming. A temporal becoming means that something does not exist until it exists. That means that it is not on the time scale, on the timeline, because it has not yet been done. It's temporal becoming, all right? Therefore, when you talk about God forgiving your future sins, uh, your future sins do not exist, all right? So when you say, my future sins are forgiven in Christ, God cannot forgive that which does not exist, all right? Stay, for instance, someone comes into this recording room now, just come in and say, oh, PFA, I forgive you of that fornication. I'm going to look at that person and say, I, I didn't fornicate. And then he says, you know, I forgive you of that fornication that will happen in several months' time. Now, I'm going to look at him. Are you prophesying or are you drunk or are you playing mad? All right, because it does not exist, right? I've not done that. It, it hasn't happened. It's temporal becoming. You need to understand that in the time scale and the timeline of your life, future sin does not exist. It is not therefore possible for you to say that God accounts for forgiveness for something that doesn't exist. If something has not been done, it doesn't make sense that, that God can pardon what does not exist. So when we talk about future sins, uh, it doesn't exist. And I want to share with you uh, personally, when I became born again, and, and this will help. When I became born again and uh, gave my life to Christ, I wasn't thinking about whether my past sins were forgiven or whether my present sins were forgiven. I, I knew that God has forgiveness in Christ. And I didn't stand there thinking uh, uh, about when I fornicate after I gave my life to Christ, what if when I steal, I'm going to do this. No, that was not in my mind because I had totally received Christ as my Lord and Savior and had repented. That means there was a change of way. All right. But there was something that also came to my mind, which I believe is very valid, is that could I, could I be, would I be faithful even in this Christian walk? I, I think that that is the question every true believer is asking. Would I be faithful? He's not asking, he's not interested in future sin because he's not thinking of committing sin. He's actually thinking, would I be faithful to my Christian commitment? And I believe that God has answered that question in Christ Jesus for us. Because the moment I became born again, what happened is that I have moved from the guilty column and I've moved into righteous column. So I've become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm now a member of the family of God. Therefore, when you become born again, you have become righteous. You have become the blessed of God. You, the forgiveness that has been tried, you, you, have, you have been moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. Therefore, I no longer speak even of, of, of committing sins every day and all of that. Rather, the question I want to answer is that whether the Lord will forgive me even when I sin. I think the question has been answered forever at Calvary. Forgiveness is with God and God will forgive me if I sin. And when I sin, I'm talking about missing the mark, missing the mark. And John said that in 1 John chapter 2, and we read from verses 1 to 2. This is very important. He said, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. All right? I think you can follow it. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He said, I've written to you so that this will guide you in order that you do not sin. He said, but if perchance you sin, he said, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And then he came and said, he, is, he himself is a propitiation for our sins. That means that the price for your sin is already made. Therefore, if you sin, it's still the same price. The same price for your past sin is the same price for your present sin is the same price for the future of your life and your Christian faith. So if I miss the mark in future, Jesus' blood is enough for me. Forgiveness, therefore, is not a once-in-a-lifetime thing. It's a continual thing. And that is the truth we find in scriptures from Matthew to Revelation. It's clear from scriptures that forgiveness is not just one, one commitment. It's an ever-going commitment with the Lord. Therefore, if I need it, I can get it with God. All right? Because I'm already in the family column. I'm already in the righteous column. I'm already in the blessed column. 
And I think this is very clear from scriptures. Mark chapter 11, 25, 26, Jesus himself speaking. He said, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. It means that there is an ever going forgiveness with God if you need it. God is going to forgive you when you need it. Say, but if you do not forgive, that tells you that there is a chance that you will not receive forgiveness from God. And he said, the reason you will not receive it uh, is if you yourself live in unforgiveness. And that's in verse 26. But if you not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Forgive your... So it's an ever-going thing. So we need to understand clearly, what is sin? Sin is missing the mark. Can it believe? Will a believer miss the mark? Yes. You see, we do not tell ourselves certain psychological uh, nonsense in order to tell ourselves it is the truth. All right. Oh, I cannot sin. I cannot sin. So what do you call that when you miss the way? What do you call that when you disobey the will of God? What do you call that? You call it, oh, I made a mistake. No, you don't call it mistake. The theological term for that uh, and the scriptural term for that is sin. It's a Messiah. It doesn't mean you are going to hell. Oh, and, and we are going to go through that. It doesn't mean you are going to hell. It simply means that I have missed how to, in the will, the way of God, and I can realign by confessing my sins. All right? Now, to directly answer the question before us, I like to discuss this teaching under these four headlines. And these four headlines, after this, we are done. You know, it's straight out of scriptures. We just tell biblical truth from scriptures. Uh, there's no emotion, just biblical truth. The first one is that according to scriptures, there is nothing called future sins in scriptures. That's number one. There is nothing called future sins in scriptures. If you read the epistles, you read the book of Acts, the focus was always on the sin that the people had committed or that they are committing. Paul never wrote to the people about a future sin they will commit. No, he was not interested in that. Acts chapter 3 verse 19, I mean, Peter was one of the first propagators of the gospel of Christ. And one of the things he said in Acts chapter 3, very key, 3.19, he says, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. That means obliterated, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. From this verse you can tell. That was talking about the sin they had committed and they were committing. He says so that it may be totally blotted out, erased, and obliterated. Now, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. On the day of Pentecost, he preached again, Peter. The Bible said that Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. He said, For the remission of sins, forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Again, he was talking about their past sins. He was talking about the sin they were living in presently. Simply stated, there is not a single verse anywhere in the Bible that pronounces us already forgiven for future sins. There is no point, no place, no verse in scripture that alludes to that fact or clearly states that fact at all. Nowhere in scriptures. Not one, not one verse, not one hint. Of it, not one it. All the promises of forgiveness has to do with sins we have already committed. So yes, the blood of Jesus is what is needed when we commit sin. But listen to this, listen to this. Our forgiveness is prepared. It's prepared. If you use a prepared meter, you've already paid for it. Right? So, so you have the kilowatts given to you and you keep using it. Listen, our forgiveness is prepared. Jesus has paid the price at Calvary. Therefore, he would apply for it as it is needed. I do not just walk around and every day I'm saying, forgive me my sins, forgive me my sins, forgive me my sins. Now, that is when you talk about sin consciousness. But when it comes to me, the Holy Spirit tells me I've done something that is wrong or I know that I did something that is wrong. But so many times you don't even need the Holy Spirit. You know because you are a student of scriptures. You have learned the way. You slept with a lady you are not married with. You already know. Right, so I can come out and say, Lord, forgive me. I apply for what has been prepared for at Calvary. 
that is responsibility that is actually what true righteousness is it's about right standing with god and you cannot stand right with god except you live by the dictate and the word of god that is what guarantees right standing not what your pastor teaches not what somebody teaches is what the bible teaches let's use an human example here if i pay for goods at, at a store for 100 million naira say i pay for bags of rice for you and i said to you every time you run out of rice just go to this store and just pick you know, pick pick anything you pick as much as you want just pick it up and take it home um, now you don't have the rice because you are not you don't have the need for it you just rice not in your heart but in as much as you have the need for rice because you are probably run out of this you are going to get into that store and go there and pick it because you have a voucher that says that i've already paid for it listen the voucher we have is the reality of Calvary. It tells us and shows us that all things are paid for, including your sins. But as much as you need it, you can always go to Calvary and apply for what has been paid for and your sins are forgiven. You see, we are not preaching a God that will think about forgiving you. No, he has paid the price. He's prepared. The price is already paid for. But it is, does not become applicable or appropriated in your life until it exists in the timeline. Don't forget, I spoke about temporal becoming. It doesn't become appropriate because you have not seen. God calls you now and says, my son, I forgive you of adultery. And you think I'm not even married. <laughs> I'm not even married. How can he do that? Forgiveness is paid for and becomes yours according to your need. There is no sin that God cannot forgive you of. There is not. None. So this is not sin consciousness. This is scriptural consciousness. Number two, the transaction of forgiveness takes place at different points in time. Some people preach that God has already forgiven all our sins, present sins and future sins. In fact, you hear them say God doesn't even see the sin we commit. So they say, I don't commit sin. I'm not, I don't commit sin. <laughs> Glory. God is a love God. God is a love God. Yes, God is a love God, but God is also a just God. And that is very true. And to back up their position, they read Jeremiah 31, they read Hebrews chapter 8, and let us see some of the scriptures they read. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, and this is good stuff. Listen to this. They say, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those says, says the Lord. Now, this is the new covenant. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his neighbor saying, Know the Lord. Say, for they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. He said, I will forgive. You see, this verse of scripture was a prophecy by Jeremiah talking about the new covenant. This same thing was repeated by the writer of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 to 12. This same prophecy was referred to by the writer of that book. But it was not speaking of future. See, it was speaking of how the Lord will not remember their sins. That means, to remember means it has occurred. That's what it means. You do not remember something that does not have a timeline. It doesn't happen at all. So you say, I will remember no more. Your sins, I will remember no more. If you sinned yesterday and you ask God for forgiveness, He will remember no more. That is the validity and the veracity of the new covenant. Now listen to this. And then Hebrews 10, 17 to 18, that they also quote says, Their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now where there is a remission of deeds, there is no longer offering for sin. So they say, you see, there's no offering for sin anymore. But the truth was that the writer of the book of Hebrew was writing to Hebrews. He was writing to Hebrews who understood and who still taught. And at that time, many of them were still offering sacrifices for their sins. And so the writer of Hebrew was saying, there is no longer an offering for sin because Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. That's what this book is talking about. That's what he's saying. The work has been done. It's finished. It is finished. 
The sin is forgiven. Therefore, when you sin, the transaction of forgiveness takes place at the point when you ask him to forgive you. Again, here is the one of the dangers of Pentecostalism where we take a verse of scripture and then we just begin to run on that verse without reading in context. Because if you have read that scripture in context uh, and you have read what they said in Hebrews chapter 10, 17 to 18, when they say they are sin, I will remember no more. If you have just read down and read further down, you will find out in Hebrews, that same chapter of scriptures, verses 26 to 27, the Bible speaks of sin. Now listen to it. It says, for if we sin willfully, willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversary. Therefore, in this same portion of scriptures, sin exists. There is something called sin. You see, if you sin, but the Bible says willfully, therefore, there are sins that are not willful. There is commission, but sin by commission, and there is sin by omission. But certain people will hear the gospel of grace and then begin to say, Oh, what? It's not called sin anymore. I can't do anything. They involve in homosexual relationship. They get involved in stealing, get involved in every kind of vice because according to them, God does not see them, see it as sin because God only sees them in Christ. Now that's wrong. That's a demented gospel. That's not the true gospel. The true gospel liberates. Paul says, shall we still continue to be slave to sin? Shall sin have dominion over us? No, no, no. We are free. We are liberated. When we get born, when we got born again, God forgives us. And so let's go to number three very quickly. Number three very quickly. The third thing I want to show you to talk about these future sins that it doesn't exist. There's nothing like that. The New Testament writers kept addressing the issues of sin among believers. New Testament writers kept addressing the issues of sin among believers. I believe that many of the writings of the New Testament would be useless and of no value. If according to certain preachers and certain gospels, that is not the gospel of the Christ, uh, according to them, there is no sin. Sin no longer applies in the vocabulary. <laughs> That's deep masonism. That is not the gospel of Christ. If according to, according to them, it is so, it therefore suggests that many verses of scriptures are irrelevant. And Bible verses cannot be relevant because there is a need for them. They have relevance. If the apostles agreed with what certain people are teaching these days, then many things will be useless. The future sins of believers had not been taken care of. If it had then, Paul, Peter, and John will have no need writing to the church about sin. But the word sin, amatia, occurred about 173 times in the New Testament. Paul wrote about it. Romans chapter 6, verses 12 to 14. Say, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness. He said, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. He was still trying to encourage them. This is how to relive the present life. This is how the faith journey should look like. Do not let sin have dominion. Paul often dealt with sin's issue when writing to different congregations, using, urging them, urging them to live a life worthy of the Christ. I want to encourage you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 was about sin. The whole chapter spoke about immorality in the church. Why will Paul speak about that? And why would Paul dedicate a whole a whole part of his letter to talk about such an issue. To talk about such an issue. Let's read 1 Corinthians 5, 11 to 13. He said, but now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother. That means there were brothers amongst them. He said, named a brother. <laughs> and brother, sister is the way believers refer to one another in the early church. 
He said, who is named a brother who is sexually immoral or conversious or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to hit with such a person. Paul called this sin. He didn't call them saints. He said, these things, people who do these things, he didn't say they are saints, which is what some of us would call them. He said, for what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? He said, do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. He said, therefore, put away from yourself the evil person. So our argument cannot be that person saw that, uh, that, you know, it doesn't matter. These are saints in Christ. No. He Paul saw the sin of the people and felt so grieved that he addressed them. And then finally, number four, the Bible teaches of the consequences of these sins. If future sins were completely erased as, as people preach, why is it that Paul thought of the consequences of these things? In 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 32, Paul thought of the consequences of these things while he spoke to them about why some of them were sick. He said they ate the table, the partake of the table. They were not supposed to. As some preachers been part of that church, they will say, why are you bringing up our sins? We are saints. After all, you called us saints in your letter. Why are you condemning us? But that's not what Paul did. Let's read that. I think it's very important we read that. 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. Look at this, verse 27. He said, Therefore, whoever eat this bread or drink this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine, examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks... In an unworthy manner, eat and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the lost body. Now listen to this. He said, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For which reason? Because they partook of that table unworthily. Why were they unworthy? Because of their sin. <laughs> this is the consequence. He said, for this reason, many are sick among you. For if we judge ourselves, we will not be judged of the Lord. So you can, you know, if some of us in the church today will hear that, they say, why is Paul writing like that? We are saints. Can, did he even call us saints himself? Why is he now saying we are condemned because of that table? Listen, dear friends, many times we teach things uh, 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 that is not according to scriptures. Listen, the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 3, G Christ told John in his revelation, Speaking by the Spirit, exposing the sins of the people. He told them at Ephesus that they had left their first law. He rebuked the believers in Pergamon for holding to the teaching that encouraged idolatry and immorality. Calling the believers in Titara to account for tolerating the teaching of Jezebel. These are scriptures. These are sins that the Christ, the resurrected Christ was pointing out by revelation. Even to John. And the apostles spoke about the sins of the people. In James chapter 5, verse 14 to 16, he says, Is anyone among you sick? So let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him. Anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. He said, Therefore, confess your trespass to one another and pray for one another. Well, James was saying that, listen, if anyone is sick among you, let him call the elders. And if he has sin, that means there are consequences for sin. Consequences. J, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. The Bible says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let's lay aside every weight and the sin we so easily ensnares us. That means sin ensnares. It puts a man in captivity. Here is the conclusion. Save time. So are my future sins forgiven? It depends on what you mean by the question. In one sense, our future sins have been atoned for. In another sense, the atonement realization may be possible for us to confess those sins and receive forgiveness. You know, the imperfect analogy that I would like to close with is that analogy of a father and a son. If the son wrongs the father, does something that the father doesn't like, he is still the son of the father. But their relationship has been affected. But it does not obliterate that relationship. 
it doesn't stop the son from being the father, from being the son of the father. But he has to mend that relationship. So confession of sin is not so that we can be born again. No. Confession of sin is so that our relationship can be restored. We therefore confess to restore relationship. Not because we have been taken away from relationship, but that thing has been dented. It's been dented. So we want to do something about it. Therefore, I would like to suggest and say to you, and this is the summary of everything, that in the lingo of the believer, there is something called sin. And it is called missing the mark. And the solution is not to deny that sin matters to God. It is to mortify the flesh. Yes, Jesus has paid the price for our sins. And like John declared, we must confess our sins knowing fully well that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the righteous. And the atonement of Calvary is prepared. Therefore, anytime I need it, I can always go there. And I think, and I know, this is what the scripture says. Don't forget, this is straight out of scriptures where we tell biblical truth and give scriptural perspective. I'd like to hear what you think, what you know from scriptures. You want to add to this just in the comment section. Share this with your family members. Share it with your colleague. This is what the Bible says. Uh, and this is what the scripture says even concerning the issue of sin. Next week is going to be very exciting. Next time I come, I'm going to share something very exciting. We're going to look at should a believer confess their sins? Because that's another rancorous thing around that thing. Should we confess our sins or should we confess Christ Jesus? People say, you know, when you sin, just confess Christ. I'm in Christ, glory. Hallelujah. I'm in Christ. I'm the blessed of Jesus. No. Let's see what the scripture says. Don't just listen to your favorite preacher. Let's look at scriptures and read according to context because the secret of God is no longer hidden from believers. Have a blessed day and the Lord keep you. Cheers.